I'll kick off the presentations with what I hope will be a um, fairly abstract framing of what the role of international organizations is, or is, yeah, whether or not they're UN or NGOs or whatever, but I'm going to focus on UN agencies simply because that's what I know best and in order to fit into the time. So I would also point out that what I'm going to say is Part, taken from a chapter that is in the Oxford Textbook of Violence Prevention, which you have advertised in your folders. And so you can read about that then when that comes out, and I think it's going to be published in November. Shall we, shall we just continue? Okay, so first off, what is an international organization? I think this applies mainly to UN agencies, but it's a formal and continuous structure. So it's not something that is here today, gone tomorrow. And it's very formally arranged through high-level agreements that are binding between different states. They're established through agreement by two or more states. They pursue a common interest, such as trying to achieve health or promote the well-being and education of children or advance human rights. And they can be government or non-government. Their functions are to articulate and aggregate interests. So, for instance, the World Health Organization articulates the interests of countries in relation to health problems and then aggregates those in the shape of, for instance, a global plan of action to prevent violence or the role of the health system in preventing violence, and so forth. They're also there to define rules, and these rules can be more or less binding. So, in international health, some of the rules that have been established by the World Health Organization, I'm using that as an example again and again, because that's what I know about, are the um, Tobacco-Free Convention, that's one of the very few binding ones, and then some of the rules around infectious disease control that came up in the wake of avian flu and H1N1. There are relatively few binding rules in the arena of health. There are more when it comes to some of the human rights areas, and perhaps, uh, Susan, you would talk about some of, some of those. They're also there to establish and change norms. So, for instance, norms around how states deal with violence within their borders. Should this be exclusively through using criminal justice approaches to catch and punish criminals and deter potential criminals, or should it involve prevention by addressing risk factors? Those are some of the norms that we seek to change. Um, they're there to alter belief systems and behavior patterns first and foremost on the part of the member states, but then, of course, on the part of people, of citizens within those member states. And it's really important here to point out, I don't know what the case is at UNICEF, but within WHO, whenever a resolution is adopted, don't worry, Michael, it's adopted by consensus of every one of the 196 member states. It's not as if you can have some or a majority say we want to sign up for the tobacco free convention or we want to sign up for this violence prevention resolution they're only adopted when all states agree to them so that means potentially all states are committed to working with their citizens to alter their beliefs and their behavior patterns in the appropriate direction wearing more bicycle helmets using fewer cigarettes using less salt uh, being nicer to their kids, etc. A big role is generating information, and we've heard from UNICEF about their really nice report on Hidden in Plain Sight, an example of aggregating information that has been generated by several UN agencies. Um, UBS Optimus Foundation has put out several very useful reports which reflect the aggregation of information by a non-UN agency. I think that's a fairly obvious role. And then, very importantly, providing support to countries. Now there, there's quite a difference between at least the different UN agencies in their capacity to do this and in relation to different areas of work. So if we look at violence prevention, WHO is far more working at the level of articulating 
uh, aggregate and aggregating interest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, bringing together information than we are in terms of country support, whereas UNICEF has a much bigger footprint on the ground in terms of operational support to countries. And other agencies like the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations uh, Population Fund, etc., will be at different degrees on this continuum between developing standards and norms and supporting action on the ground. So examples of international organizations within the United Nations family that address violence are here. We see the World Health Organization, UNICEF, UN Women, United Nations Development Program, the Human Rights Commission, the United Nations Population Fund, and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, of those, we have people from UNODC, UNICEF, WHO here. I'm not sure if we have anybody from UNFPA, Human Rights. UNDP were meant to be here, but she was deployed in Afghanistan, so she couldn't get here. And I'm not sure if anybody from UN Women is here, but we'll have to make sure they're here in the future. Okay, so it's obviously really good to have lots of different agencies committed to, for instance, preventing violence and mitigating its consequences. It's obviously really good because they bring diverse approaches to the problem, so it can corral these different sectors of society and government into addressing a common goal, such as reducing violence. And I think some of the main paradigms or frames of reference that are brought in by these UN agencies are listed here, the criminal justice, public health, human rights, there may be others, but this is an example. However, I'm not sure what is in the middle of the Venn diagram. Because it could be that we share an evidence-based approach. It could be that we share a life course approach to doing things. But it could be something else. It could be that we don't share enough common ground. I'm not sure. And I think filling in those question marks is a really, really important task for the future. And I think we've, we're doing it. I think we've been doing it much better in the last decade than before. But there's still a way to go. We've still got to learn how to articulate a rights-based approach which is essentially looking at the state and looking at the use of changing of norms and laws with a population-based public health approach which is a very different kind of animal. They're both important, but I'm not sure we've quite learned to dance properly together. So in terms of um, history, Manuel is here, and this is for Manuel. No. Uh, there is something of a history. It's a short history, unlike the kind of histories that Manuel deals with when he's looking at homicide. We can see a formative, normative, and operational phase in terms of how UN agencies have been dealing with the problem of violence. And here I'm talking essentially, sorry, David, about interpersonal violence. The whole UN system, I think, was established to address forms of collective violence, and I take that for granted, and I take that as continuous and an utterly important context. The formative phase is when advocacy for increased attention to violence, to homicide, to child abuse, etc., started to emerge within these agencies. And I think one of the first agencies ever to do this was ISPCA, International Society for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. They're not UN, but they're the first international agency to start saying, let's get together and do something. I think it was UNODC that put the others to the post in terms of coming up with the Seville Declaration, which declared that violence is not a biological <coughs> imperative, and therefore, or, or sorry, I'm going to get this wrong, Manuel will get cross with me, but anyway, they said that it's possible to alter patterns of violence, that it's not built in and unchangeable. And that was probably important, but Manuel has got some appropriate reservations about that. In this formative phase, there was also the establishing of mandates. So, for instance, in WHO, in about 1993, World Health Day was devoted to preventing violence and injuries, etc. And in 1996, the first World Health Assembly resolution was passed, which requested the organization to develop a science-based approach, etc. And then there was establishing approaches. So our request from the World Health Assembly to establish a science-based approach led in WHO to, into 
the normative phase. And the normative phase, for us at least, was marked by publication of the World Report on Violence and Health, which set out the framework that we bring to this party. I think that normative phase lasted between 2000 and 2010. Other signal moments within it have to do with the uh, violence against women, the establishment of special rapporteurs on violence against women, children, the Pinero's report on violence against children, uh, Marta Santos Pius being established, and so forth. Alongside all of this, programs began to be established within the UN agencies. Departments were established, like our Department on Violence and Injury Prevention, or I'm not, you can tell more, but I, I assume that within the Child Protection Group, you established some unit that is going to address violence prevention, et cetera, et cetera. And with this, technical guidance started to be published. Guidance on how to prevent violence, on how to do mixed surveys and ask questions about parental disciplining practices and so forth. Then, an operational phase is where we are at now. And I think that came about because of people like Mike Feigelson and some of the, the UBS Optimus Foundation who said, hey, you're publishing lots of guidance, but it's all kind of saying the same thing. Isn't the issue now not what we need to do, but how we should be doing it in countries where we need to do it and find out if it works there? And I'm not quoting you, but that for me was the mo moment when the operational phase came about. And then what does this mean? Supporting more violence prevention work on the ground. Doing the violence against children surveys that are being carried out under the Together for Girls umbrella involving UNICEF CDC. Working to develop pilot prevention programs for child maltreatment. Working together with UNODC to try and develop a transsectoral approach to preventing violence in Jamaica, etc., etc. Um, one of the big messages or calls within this operational phase, we've heard it again and again throughout the conference, is to expand the evidence base so more low and middle income countries are brought on board. And I'm delighted to say that thanks to the Children and Violence Evaluation Challenge Fund, we can actually see the impact of that in the number of trials that we have registered on our violence prevention evidence base, which has increased quite clearly because of that. And some of those things are now yielding publications. So it was also mentioned by Rachel Jukes, the uh, violence, uh, what works to prevent violence, this big DFID grant that has been established, which is kind of helping to operationalize things. And of course, mobilizing governments. Our latest example is the World Health Assembly uh, resolution of May this year, which calls on us to help them to do better with their health sector involvement in violence prevention. So this is my concluding slide. I think there's been good progress. Violence is on the global issue map. Not high enough yet, but it's getting there. There's very clearly networks developing. And net different networks are more together than ever before. And there's certainly some, but there can still be more harmonization of approaches. So those question marks get replaced with some substantive things. But political and financial re support remains inadequate. <coughs> Because of that, I think there's still some kind of fragmentation, and I think the inadequacy of resources stokes competition between different players all scrambling for the same buck. So, on that happy note, I'm finished. Okay.